Hey, I'm back from my trip. And I'm married now. Hi everyone, I'm back from my cruise. Uh, for those of you who didn't know, I was actually on my honeymoon, got married in January, and yeah, I'm back in cold, frigid Ottawa. The cruise was great. We hit up a number of different countries in the Caribbean. Uh, didn't take many photos or video, but I did take this very brief one from a Margaritaville in Jamaica. That's the boat that uh, me and my wife were on. But now I'm back and I'm here again with Craig Lord who is filming for me and will be asking me the questions in the Q&A. Say hi, Craig. I was not invited on the honeymoon. So the Q&A videos, we take things a bit more casually, uh, taking questions from the YouTube comment section and answering them. And this was actually the first time that I had way too many questions to answer. So thank you guys for submitting questions and I'm sorry if I don't get to them, uh, but we have a list of pretty good questions for this week. Uh, if you have any further questions, leave a comment in the video and we will of course get to them if we can. So without further ado, first question. Mikolas Kikas asks, how is it possible that the derivative market represents 10x the world economy? And what does this mean if everyone tries to cash in all at once? Yeah, so I know there are some estimates that put the derivatives market at like 1.2 quadrillion dollars. Um, and yeah, so that's about 10 times global GDP or gross domestic product. Uh, but it's kind of a misleading number. The reason for that is that a lot of derivatives have a notional value that isn't necessarily equivalent to their market value. So a great example of this is an interest rate swap. With an interest rate swap, you have two people take out a loan and then they essentially pay the other person's interest rate. Uh, and one might be fixed, one might be variable. And depending on which one's higher or lower, obviously the person who's paying the lower interest rate profits. But with an interest rate swap, the notional value could be millions of dollars, but the only amount of cash that changes hands is the difference between the two interest rates being paid. So that's an example of why the value of the derivatives market is so high, but you don't actually see that level of cash changing hands in the market. Now, in terms of what would happen if everyone tried to cash out their derivative, uh, to an extent, that's kind of what happened in 2008, uh, when some companies had made all these agreements uh, for example, AIG, the insurance company. And then when everyone came to cash out, uh, they didn't have enough cash to, to meet the obligations. Uh, and they almost went under because of that. They only survived because of government intervention. So that's an example of what would happen if everyone kind of tried to cash out at the same time. Mind you, that only occurred because uh, an event that was deemed rare that they didn't think would happen, happened. And it was kind of an insurance payout where there were all these insurance claims uh, that they didn't expect. So it's a bit different, but that's kind of an insight as to what would happen if people actually did that. Linagy asks, are dividends a way for a company to be more attractive to investors while passing the tax liability off to them? No, uh, dividends are an after-tax item for uh, companies. So companies make their money in revenue, uh, they pay all their expenses, and then they have their, their net income before taxes. Uh, and then taxes are removed from that. And after that point, there's no more tax obligation from the company. Uh, and dividends are paid from that after tax net income. So from the company's perspective, uh, from a tax standpoint, it doesn't matter whether they pay it out or keep it, they won't pay any more taxes. Um, but there is a double taxation for the investor. If the investor receives the dividend, they have to pay that personal tax on it. But no, from a, uh, for the company, there's no advantage to pay no dividend versus keeping it. Um, from a tax standpoint. On the Great Depression video, Mayra VS asks, why don't you mention the impact of tariffs and protectionism? Yeah, in hindsight, this is something that I wish I talked more about in the video. When countries start to see the impacts of the Great Depression, uh, a lot of them started to turn to protectionism with the thought that if they could prevent other, com other countries from taking their jobs, uh, that you know they could boost their own economies. Uh, but it largely backfired. You know, countries like America, uh, who had the Smoot-Hawley Act, uh, increased tariffs on, I think, over 25,000 goods, and it only hurt them even more, essentially limiting economic activity uh, to domestic operations. Uh, so instead of trading with other countries, everyone tried to contain their own economies, and it just, it exacerbated the situation. Um, now, I didn't touch on it initially with my video because I kind of wanted to focus on the lead up to the Great Depression, whereas protectionism, from my understanding, uh, was something that kind of happened after the stock crash 
after uh, the initial recession that made it worse. Uh, so it's very important to the situation and I, and I want to emphasize that. Uh, and I wish I had included it more, uh, but I just wanted to explain that the reason why it wasn't in there was I was focusing on what led up to that situation. Max Tangent asks, is that polyphonic reading the questions? Polyphonic. How am I supposed to know if it's polyphonic? He doesn't show his face in the videos. Wait, it says here he's in Ottawa. Of course. <laughs> it makes so much sense now. How, how can I be so blind? Craig, are you polyphonic? I'm not polyphonic. Craig. I'm not polyphonic. Craig, you're poly... No? I'm not polyphonic, man. All right, well, never mind. How's Noah? He's good. Keep on learning asks, what software do you use to animate? In terms of creating the actual videos, I use Adobe Premiere Pro CS6. Um, it's a pretty useful video editing software. You know, it's, most video editing softwares kind of follow the same template, uh, but I find all the tools I need on, on that program. Uh, for drawing the images, I actually use PowerPoint, which I mentioned in my anniversary video. Why I'm still using PowerPoint, I don't know. I should really figure something out, but I've just been, it's just easy enough. I know how to use it. So, you know, all my images are basic shapes. And then I use a Photoshop-esque open source software to save the images. And all my animations are just basic movements and rotations and size changes of images. It's really amateur. And if you saw how I do most of the complicated looking stuff on Adobe Premiere, you'd probably scoff. It's pretty, uh, pretty primal to an extent, but uh, it works for me and you know, I'm kind of lazy, so I haven't taken time to learn proper animation. Uh, but yeah, so it works for me and I'm happy with it. You know, whatever. No one's judging. And that's all the questions we have. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions in the future, make sure to leave a comment down below and Craig and I will do our best to get to them. Make sure to like and subscribe if you like the video and hit the bell icon if you want notifications about future videos. For The Play Magle, my name is Richard Coffin. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you.